This is Sound Lives, a new music box podcast sharing insights and stories from people who dedicate their lives to new music. Brought to you by New Music USA, the resource for adventurous creators and listeners in the U.S. and beyond. Welcome to Sound Lives. I'm Frank J. O'Terry, and my guest today is Tanya Leone. Tanya Leone was the first individual composer I ever spoke with for New Music Box more than 23 years ago. And now she is the first person I ever had a one-on-one conversation with twice for New Music Box. In those 23 years, she has composed tons of fascinating music, including this ballet Anura we are listening to. In a performance she is conducting featuring the Son Sonora Voices, the Son Sonora Ensemble, and Dance Brazil Percussion, featured on an Albany CD. Tanya also won the Pulitzer Prize, and now she is about to be honored at the Kennedy Center. We have a lot of catching up to do. It is so great to see you over Zoom. It's, of course, better to see you in person, but... I know, I know. Uh, We have to correct that one. (laughs) I'll take what I can get. It's hard to believe that we recorded a talk for New Music Box over 23 years ago. You were the very first individual composer that I did a talk with. And in all these years, you should know, we have never spoken to anybody twice. So you are the first again (laughs) with this. So much has happened in those 23 years in your life, in your career as a composer, as a musical citizen. It seemed a shame that we couldn't talk about those things, which we didn't talk about 23 years ago because they didn't exist yet, you know? Yes. But Uh then also, you know, the world has completely changed. You know, 23 years ago, there was no social media. There was no Wikipedia. It was still the 20th century. Bill Clinton was president. (laughs) You know? But I read the talk again this morning, and it amazed me, despite it being so long ago, how pertinent so much of what we talked about is to the current moment as well. Yes. You know, a lot of things have changed, but a lot of things have not changed. And a lot of the issues that we're facing as individual creators and within our society are still very much the same issues, even though there's been a lot of positive movement to change things. But these things move very slowly. From your perspective, what would you say is the most significant change in our musical community since the 21st century began? This is an aspect that I believe we spoke then and uh, an aspect that is being revisited in a different way right now. And it has to do with inclusion of composers of color, more exposure for women, and uh, more acceptance of people the way they are. The thing that I think that is a provocateur at this point how much is being done, and then always the question that, is this going to last? Right. So this is the, the kind of thing that we will see, because also there are new generations of composers that have emerged, and they are giving space at this time for the conversation. When I say how much they are going to be a lasting effect in the environment, you know, and in the musical environment specifically, when we talk about concert music. And that is something that 20 years from now, 40 years from now, will be something that one calibrate to see if the impact was real or it was a thing of the moment. And another aspect to this that I think is really significant, and we talked about it, it was amazing. I looked back at this, it's like we were talking about this stuff back (laughs) then. Obviously, cultural identity and background has an impact on every composer. It's part of who that composer is because you are the result of your experiences. But at the same time, it is not the sum total. And identity is a lot more complex than these one-liners that we're boxed into. And I know that for you, you come from a background from people all over the world. So all of those traditions are your heritage, all of them. For me, as somebody who's adopted, it's sort of the opposite thing. It's like none of them are. But because none of them are, all of them are. So I sort of feel like 
those things get left out when we try to pigeonhole a composer and say, you are this or you are that. Well, you know that I always defied categorization. I don't like to be categorized because my identity is fluid. And the one that I was last week is not the one that I'm talking to you right now. Every experience in my life mold me in ways that I never know where it's going. And uh, it's very interesting because, I mean, specifically, I don't see my family as often. And when I have the opportunity to see them, not because I don't want to see them, but the thing is that we are in five different countries. And the thing is that when I get to see them, they tell me how much I have changed. And the thing is that I am not aware of that. But now I realize that I cannot say my identity is this or that because, as I said, it's fluid and it's changing all the time. Mm -hmm. Which is as it should be. If you're creating, you're always on to the new project. You're always growing. You're always developing. We have these terms that we make for people, even aside from the cultural ones. We say, you know, like emerging composer or established composer. In a way, I mean, shouldn't we all be always emerging? Shouldn't we always be on to the next thing? Yes, I mean, that's how I feel. I mean, that's why I talk about identity in that way, because I'm constantly emerging and I'm constantly discovering things that I didn't know that I could do or things that actually change my focus in unexpected ways. It's relearning myself every 24 hours. It's just fantastic. It's great to wake up every morning to a new day, <laughs> a new life. Getting back to this, I guess it's sort of shocking to me, you know, to see where you're at now, where your music is at now. When we talked back in 1999, there was only one CD devoted exclusively to your music, that disc on CRI. That was the only one. And I love that disc and I wanted to talk to you. And since then, there is this amazing disc of ballets, which I remember I did the notes for. I love those pieces so much. You know, one of them was available on LP at one point, but long gone. But so, so great to have that back in the catalog. Let's hear some of Haiku in a performance by the Dance Theater of Harlem Ensemble conducted by Tanya Leon from that same Albany CD. And then the disc of chamber works on bridge. And then this brand new, amazing solo piano disc that I just love. Adam Kent, really great. And I think he really gets your music. And it was such a joy to hear that. Adam has a lot of experience, not because that informed him, but he has gone many, many times to Cuba. He captures the spirit of the culture. I am a blend of many cultures. Also, I mean, he has gone many, many times to Spain, and that is one of the influences in my family. So he gets into my pieces in a way that is very insightful, and he has a great technique. So whatever demands that I may place on him, he just flawlessly <laughs> he gets to it and develops, you know, beautifully. This is Adam Kent performing Tanya Leon's Tumbao from his CD of her piano music on Albany released earlier this year.
one of the things you said to me years ago, and it's something we've talked about off camera forever, you know, since then, is there's only so much stuff that you can put on the page for music. Yeah, notation gets you very far, but it doesn't get you to the finish line. And certainly with a lot of your music and things that you're responding to and the various traditions that combine in your music, there's this whole sense of rhythm, which you can notate it precisely on the page, but if you're so busy being precise, you're missing the fundamental thing, which is to groove, which is to have tumbao, as you say. So how do you get that? How do you get somebody who does not have that background to well, do Well, uh, one of the things that I have experienced is uh, when I have an opportunity to play with or to actually work with the interpreter, they tell me that they capture this aha moment which is very different because it's anybody, as far as my rhythmical syntax, is going to interpret what they see mathematically speaking. The whole thing sounds devoid of soul. I don't uh, do that for effect. It's something that is natural in me. I get very interested when I have read accounts of my music and talking about my rhythmical inventiveness. I don't invent anything. That's what I hear, and that is what I put on the page. It might have to do with the fact that I grew up in a society or in a culture that is very rhythmical, something that I didn't notice until I returned after many years that I realized, and it's in the people's walk, in the people's gestures. Everywhere you're walking, you know, I mean, there's music in the background. I have no idea. But not everything is rhythmical, you know, because I write uh, pieces that are, might be very slow or very lyrical. But my interpretation of life had to do, in a way, with the rhythm of life. Even when something is very slow, there is a current which is behind. Like, I'm talking to you right now, but the beating of my heart is very different than the rhythm of my conversation, you see? Mm. And that is what I'm talking about, rhythm. Rhythm is not what we translate like that, with that, with that. No, 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 no. It's, it's the rhythm of life, the rhythm of watching my plants when a leaf comes out and then by the time it's next week, the leaf is bigger. <laughs> and, and there was a rhythm in that growth that I, I didn't capture, but it would be interesting for me to sit down and stare at the, at the leaf for a week to see if I understand what is the process of what is, is the pace of the leaf growing up? There's definitely a different approach to rhythm in Tanya Leon's orchestral work, Horizons. Let's listen to a little of the NDR Symphony Orchestra's performance of it, conducted by Peter Ruzica, released on a CD devoted to Tanya Leon's music on Bridge. One of the problems that we got bogged down with in the 20th century that hopefully, you know, we'll get bogged out of, right, in the 21st, <laughs> is people were so obsessed with getting notes and rhythms right, what was on the page, and maybe in so doing, not feeling it. And in that process, they got the answers right, but they failed the test, right? There have been amazing performances of Milton Babbitt's music and Elliot Carter's music yeah. when a player interprets it and makes it their own. But when you're so busy saying, oh, this is so hard, but I got to make this right, you can hear it and it's not fun to listen to at all. Yes. In Milton Babbitt, I still hear jazz 
reflections in some of his passages that might be very intellectually realized by others, I see it like a fluid moment, you know, it's like letting go in a way, maybe because I know about his background and uh, even conversations with him. We talked about that. There was a famous conversation that I could never, ever, ever forget. We were in a Chinese restaurant on Columbus Avenue. Of course, that none of that exists right now. But uh, it was Milton Bobby Feldman. Wow. Um, <laughs> yes, Duffy and myself. Wow. And we were talking about each other's background. And that is when he talked about he's actually playing jazz and how involved he was with that before he turned. It was so exhilarating conversation. We were laughing, we were carrying on, we were having fried rice. I mean, (laughs) it's something that I will never forget. The ghosts of that conversation and their images still linger with me. Here's a bit of another work on that bridge CD, Axon, featuring Mari Kimura on violin and interactive computer. to see you on stage just last weekend at Town Hall conducting Town Hall. Laura Kaminsky's <laughs> new opera. As somebody who's involved in the performance of music as well as the creation of it, you get that it has to breathe, that it has to have this life, this energy, this constant change and growing like the leaves of a plant, as you say. Yes, I mean, I enjoy that piece tremendously. I mean, besides working with Laura, getting to know what she wanted out of the music and the singers and the musicians. And the thing is that close a circle with us in a way to start a new one, because the first time that I interpreted her music was precisely at Town Hall. Wow. 40 years ago. Wow. I know. I mean, (laughs) we were like... Wow, is this really happening? (laughs) And of course, for her, it was just such a tremendous homecoming because she was the artistic director there. And it was just so wonderful seeing all the people who love her there in that audience. I mean, the only thing I felt while we were there, I thought, wow, there are so many people (laughs) and we're masked up. It's like, we're still not over this ridiculous pandemic. And it's like, is this safe? But it felt so good. It's like, I don't want to worry. Another circle that I want to talk about, a really big one, because so many things happened in between that circle. And it's a lot shorter time span, but it is a huge circle. And that is the circle from February 2020 to October 2022. It's just two and a half years. But... In February 2020, I was in the audience for the world premiere of your orchestra piece, Stride. And it was one of the last concerts I went to in that space. And of course, that space was closed while they were redesigning it and redoing the sound and everything. But it was also closed because everything was closed. You know, the world completely shut down. But I remember just feeling so exhilarated at that performance and loving that piece and such an energy in the room, not knowing that just like a few weeks later, we'd all be locked in our apartments and not you know, going anywhere for like a year. And But then to come back and hear it again, to hear the piece, a new piece that is now not a new piece, right? It's not a premiere. It's now, and it wasn't the opening work on the concert. It was on the second half in the same hall, but it's a different hall. The sound is different. It was just such a wonderful circle. And 
of course, in between, you know, no small thing, it won the Pulitzer Prize. Every time that I think about that piece and writing the piece and writing a piece for the Philharmonic, which I had a relationship with from the past and seeing so many players that are still there that greeted me like greeting a family member, it was really something else. And of course, I mean, the first time when you hear your pieces, I don't know, you're there, but you're not there. You recognize some of it in the pieces, but then others, you don't recognize the piece. And then the nervousness of having a piece written for a, a premier orchestra and uh, what was going to happen. So I, I had no expectation whatsoever. And I was surprised about audience reactions and comments from friends and even the musicians and and the music director, you know, I, I work with Jap. He's a composer also. So therefore, our conversation uh, was deeper in a way. It was not about how to conduct this. But, I mean, it was more the meaning uh, behind each section and what we were after. The thing is that uh, listening to the piece again, now I was listening to the piece for the first time. <laughs> Something that in a way I didn't do the, when it was premiered because I was just too nervous. And I, uh, the piece brought me back to one of those moments that I experienced when writing it. You remember in the middle of the piece, there is this thing that appears that becomes sort of like a march, you know? And I can tell you when I was writing the piece, my mind went back to my arrival in the United States. I equated the impetus of Susan B. Anthony going with all those women for a petition. And I put that in balance to what I witnessed for the first time in my life, which was the marches of Martin Luther King, because he was alive when I arrived here. And that is when I saw for the first time something like that. So that came to my mind and that provoked that moment where everything stops. And all of a sudden, this sort of like seemingly gigantic foot starts walking slowly at a pace that you cannot count because I put it always in an entrance that it was unexpected. So mm -hmm. it's not with a beat. It might be entering in a fraction of a 16 note as a 30 second or something like that. It was wonderful watching the bass section is for the bass and the percussion is with a sound block. If you're wearing a boot or something like that and you are on a rough pavement, you have that kind of thing, right? And that is something that when I heard it the first time again, this time, it sent me to the same place. Mm. It's like I left the hole and I got in my mind the picture of these marches again. Here's an excerpt of Stride from the New York Philharmonic's performance of it earlier this season conducted by Jaap van Sweden that we were kindly granted permission to include here by the New York Philharmonic. I don't write from my head only. Of course, we have all these techniques and all of these things that we employ and, and we know what pitches to use and things like that. But for me, intuition is very important. And that was a moment of intuition that translates nowadays. And those that listen to the piece, they talk about that moment. My intuition told me at that moment this, and I didn't doubt it. 
Well, it was extremely effective both times. You know, I heard it. I was able to pay attention. I didn't have the pressure of it being my piece being premiered, so I was able to hear it the first time. <laughs> but what I will say is so interesting, you know, comparing those concerts. On that world premiere performance, you were the living composer, right? Everything else yes. was repertoire. I think it was like Brahms violin concerto and... <laughs> I was a cavalier, you know, like it's war horses that are great music, but all stuff we heard before. This was the first thing that we never heard before on that concert. And then the concert that just happened, there were three living composers and all of them were there. And it was so exciting. And one piece was a world premiere. I'd obviously heard your piece before, so it wasn't a new piece to me. But it might have been a new piece to other people in the audience. And, you know, Marcos Balter's piece was brand new. John Adams's piece has been done before. I certainly heard it before, but I didn't hear this orchestra do it. It was interesting that the Respighi was outnumbered by the new pieces. And it kind of made the oh. Respighi interesting in a way that it perhaps more interesting than it would have been if it was just one work on a standard repertoire concert. It gave every piece a little bit more special flavor, which I thought was beautiful and especially beautiful for an opening concert. It's so nice to see that an orchestra trusts that an audience will come to an opening concert if it's mostly new music. Of course they'll come. They were there. Yes. It was packed. I was very impressed about that too, you know, and that the audience embraced each of the living composers' pieces in a way that was significant. Every time that a composer went on stage to take a bow, it felt so good for the three of us. I mean, we were talking about that, actually. And I thought the pre-concert talk was also wonderful. It was great to have that. And the fact is, this wasn't a new music concert. It was a New York Philharmonic concert, but there happened to be three living composers there. And it was presented as though this is the way things are, you know? Yes. Mm -hmm. But it's so often not the way things are. And I wonder, you know, I wonder hearing Stride the first time when it was the concert opener, once upon a time, certainly back when we talked in 1999, the way a composer, a living composer got on a program, if they got on a program of an orchestra most of the time, was to write a short, upbeat piece that could be put at the opening. And then the people mm -hmm. don't want to hear it come in late. You know, they get their their concerto with the top soloist and their you know their their Tchaikovsky symphony and then they go home. But now this is so different to have new pieces played all through a program, pieces by living people. And this is really, you know, the way it should be. A piece of Tanya Leon's that has definitely entered the repertoire is her flute piano duo Alma. There are now three different recordings of it available. Let's listen to some of a brand new one featuring flutist Jennifer Grimm and pianist Michael Shepard released on New Focus Recordings. <laughs> I think that now we are starting to understand the weight of the new, which is not so new in a way, because this is the weight of what the arts have been for centuries. And always the same reaction, you know, sometimes favorably, sometimes not favorably. And every time that I go to the opera to actually listen and to the opera Carmen, I always remember 
the disastrous emotional impact that it did for BC at a time that it was totally negated the quality of this piece mm. that he wrote and he was criticized and he was saying that and the critics were saying that the piece was vulgar and by the time the piece was actually performed he died he never understood that his piece would become a classic now it's a piece that is in every opera house constantly celebrated by audiences and this is one of the tragedy that has to do with the arts to be validated i always say that Whatever we're doing artistically right now is actually the legacy and the testament that we're leaving for future generations. So you yourself as a composer, you have written operas, you have written all kinds of music, orchestra, you know, I mean, who knows what is it going to be discussed in year 3000 something as far as the music that was created in this era. It's true. And I think it is important to have this balance. When I was younger, I would say, oh, you know, we heard all these old pieces before. Let's just hear the new pieces. I think there does need to be a combination. There does need to be a synthesis. And of course, it was so interesting. John Adams's piece was a 20th century piece. So it's an old piece from the perspective of now we're in a new century. He's still very much with us. And from an orchestral context, it's a new piece, but it's not a new piece. And that's great. It's great that it becomes repertoire. And now Stride just premiered only two years ago. Now it is repertoire as well. You want these pieces to have a life and to continue. I almost think as we're talking, I just had this, this crazy idea that the new piece in the past, the new piece was the concert opener. Maybe the concert opener should always be an old piece. That way you kind of <laughs> settle in. This is what you know, and it prepares you for the thing you don't know yet that's coming up. That would be fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but I don't know if there are enough older pieces that are short and high energy enough to fill that role. But maybe there shouldn't be one mood for these kinds of pieces. Well, you know, in my consciousness, I think that all these pieces have to be played and that composers have to have the opportunity to have a space where to say. And uh, the same way that the museums, you know, you go to MoMA and you see the artists' uh, rendition, the biggest artists and the ones that, as you said before, or we said, emerging, there's a whole display and nobody actually runs out of the room because they don't understand the graphics or the images in the canvas. So I think that the same thing should happen in the concert hall. And as far as the concert hall is included, you know me, all genres of music count. Yes. Yes. The Philharmonic did a collaboration with Etienne Charles, and then all of a sudden, the Philharmonic was playing a rhythm that later I was talking to Jab about it, where Jab was actually in three, and then the ensemble that was playing maybe in nine eighths or 12 eighths, and with a syncopation that is called a synchio, which actually accents over five. The coordination was spectacular. The audience was literally dancing in their seats. And it was actually was announced as the first time that the Philharmonic does that kind of collaboration. So and it was a totally different genre of music. And of course, you know, the Philharmonic did great job doing Sondheim's musicals and they, you know, were able to make that come across. I'm reminded of the talk I had a few years ago with Hannibal about his work with the Philadelphia Orchestra. And yes. now we have musicians who are playing in orchestras who also play in salsa bands, who play in jazz groups and rock groups. People are more polymusical, polystylistic than they once were. They weren't in just one pocket, which seems to me an interesting segue to talk about the Kennedy Center honors that are coming up for you. There was a long time when the so-called classical music world didn't pay attention to any other music and kind of disparaged any music creator who was working in any genre. And I'm so happy everything has opened up and that there's all this other stuff out there. But my fear is that sometimes in the popular music world, they will pay attention to every type of music making except 
so-called classical music because maybe they just assume that it's just people playing a bunch of old dead guys you know, from 200 years ago and they don't realize that there are people still doing this. So it made me so happy to see that in addition to Gladys Knight and U2, they've done amazing contributions to music, but they're also honoring somebody who's written tons of music, but who's written for the orchestra, you. I grew up in a conservatory with a training that was a French training, you know, with solfege from day one, and then all the repertoire of a pianist. And that is how I arrived in the United States, thinking that my career was concert pianist. I had the shops, I had won competitions. Composition came out of the left field because it's something that it was not in my consciousness. I didn't have plans for something like that. It just happened. And the thing is that even when I was in Cuba, I was at the conservatory, but on the weekends, we would go out and play all kinds of music. We were playing all the popular music of the trends. I was doing songs with my brother. We sang as duets. He had a little group of musicians. And then every opportunity, we were dancing salsa. To this day, I said, okay, I can conduct Stravinsky, play him the means, but I dance salsa. That is in me, and nobody's going to take that away from me. So therefore, for me, popular music is something that is part of my canvas as well. I have no problem with that. And with the Dance Theater of Harlem, the dancers will teach me the dances of the time. After doing ballet, Swan Lake, and everything, you know, we would end up in a discotheque dancing, whichever dance was of the moment. So I have never established that kind of demarcation where I said, well, I'm this, or I'm that, or I favor this. No, when I was in China, and now we have all these pipa concertos and erhu concertos, instruments that 30, 40 years ago, we were not able to explore. And that is how things have been changing dramatically. But I went there, and I was actually exposed to the Peking Opera, which to this day have captivated me because I don't know anything about that system. And I am captivated by tabla drumming, for example, which is totally different than the type of rhythmical complexities that we're talking about before. And I think that uh, the music of the cultures of the world, which is actually the seed of the leave of what we do, musically speaking, we call it folk music. But the thing is that that music that came in out of the intuition of that culture is what had germinated into everything that we do. The languages that have been created from 12-tone language, you know, to tonal language, to what we call atonal or post-tonal, I mean, all these words that we invent to describe these things, it germinates out of the same thing. I mean, it's a human spirit and the human creation in all manifestations. Therefore, I'm very honored, and I was very surprised with the call that told me that I was going to be part of this group, because I said, how come? What happened? <laughs> you know, <laughs> who thought of something like this, you know, for me to represent our community? We say our community. Ideally, should be no walls between musics, but there exactly. are. And yes. the thing is, the classical world isn't the only world, the only silo that puts them up. Other communities do too. The popular music community, and there are many of them, also have their walls. So it made me very happy to see that this is an embrace of so many different things. This gets to you as a musical citizen, and I want to spend some time talking about that and the importance of that. And I know for both of us and for so many other people in our community, John Duffy and Fran Richard have been really important mentors. And both of them instilled this idea that living composers must be visible, that we need to see this person behind the curtain, that it isn't just the notes on the page. And at the end of the day, we need to know who that person is. You've done such a huge job with that in a very grassroots way. It's amazing you know, with composers now. I mean, that's a very kind of bare bones grassroots project. But I know for me, certainly during the pandemic, it was a lifeline to be able to hear all those talks from those different composers, to actually do one myself. It was just such a, a wonderful, wonderful thing. 
now at Composers Now, we are having conversations with all kinds of composers. In fact, the upcoming festival, the opening is going to, for the first time, have a composer of hip hop, nice. which is coming with his group. It's interesting for me because, I mean, we have had conversation of composers of different aspects of music or different genres of music, whatever you want to say. And it's interesting because after talking for five minutes, they are all talking about the same thing. Yes. They are talking about the same techniques. <laughs> They're talking about structure. It is fascinating to hear them, you know, one asking the other, and how do you do such and such? And the other one, well, yes, but you know, I admire because I mean, you do such and such. It's like finding family members in other parts of the world that you didn't know exist. Mm. And that is what fascinates me because I mean, it's, it's about the art of composition in whichever way you manifest it. And not everybody had to write the symphony. What about the composers that write tangos? I mean, what happened when we discovered Piazzolla? All of a sudden, the so-called classical music community embraced Piazzolla. Everybody wanted to play the tango. <laughs> you see? And this is what I'm trying to say, you know, sometimes, just for argument's sake, I said, what's the difference between a waltz and a mambo? All of these manifestations are something that are very interesting. And at Composers Now, this is what we do. We have this discussion. We expose the world of a specific composer in their own words. We don't interfere. We give a chance to the composer to talk about his or her development or, or what they are trying to do, all kind of works. It doesn't have to be acoustic work. It could be electroacoustic work. It could be actually installations. I mean, it could be anything. But it's about the art of composition. As you said, I mean, it's a an organization which is grassroots and in a way it's a continuum of the work that uh, John Duffy began and that uh, Brian Richard you know supports I mean she's she's here with us they were both big mentors of mine and it's something that uh, I want to give back you know because I mean I arrived here never knowing that this was going to happen after so many years they embraced me and encouraged me and supported me. I mean, it's something that I would never forget. Let's listen to some of Tanya Leon's Indigena, performed by Continuum, conducted by Tanya Leon, from the very first CD devoted exclusively to her music, released on CRI and now available from New World Records. <laughs> The final area I want to talk about, because I listened to it again this week in preparing a talk with you. I hadn't listened to it in a number of years, and it was nice to get back to it. Thankfully, I have a private recording of it because it was never released commercially, and that's your opera Scourge of Hyacinths. It's a sadness to me that that still has not been commercially recorded and that there haven't been productions. I've never seen it. I've only heard it. It hasn't been done here. But what amazed me about it was how timely that also is for this current moment when you have leaders in the world like Vladimir Putin and Xi Jinping and Bolsonaro and all of these people who are these strong men enforcing ideas of obedience. I feel like now the time is ripe for this opera to be done all over the world and to talk about these issues, about why we keep glomming on to these like strong men figures all over the world. The text came out of Wallace Oyinka, a man that also have espoused very, very high standards. I uh, owe that to Henry Louis Gates, which is the one that sent him my music, thinking that the two of us, it would be interesting for us to collaborate. And it really happened. 21 performances in five different countries, not in the United States, mainly Europe and Mexico. 
one of the things that I felt very, very keen in terms of my interpretations of society and humanity is when people attain power. I don't know what the sensation is for a human being to be with a microphone in front of millions of people shouting their name. I have no idea what that does to that human being. And some of these people that get to that kind of power might believe they are gods. And then all kind of rules and regulations start coming up in order to control the mass. And also rules and regulations spoken in the name of a mass. I have never been involved in politics, even that I know that politics is everything. There's politics in families, politics in neighborhoods, in the office, in the towns, in the countries. But it's something that I have avoided from the first time of, of thinking rationally in terms of that type of situation. Maybe because I don't believe in what I've been told and I have had the experience that really going against odds to accomplish anything. And maybe because anything offering me a paradise, I always have uh, some kind of um, doubtness that what is this person talking about, you know, that they are going to do for me that I cannot do for myself. That is something that really, really made me uh, very keen to actually work on this opera. Besides that, the mother of the opera was praying to a deity that I knew before the text was given to me. And that is the deity of Jemanja, which is a deity that comes from in Cuba, you know, called Santeria, which is actually the mix of Catholicism and Yoruba traditions brought by the Africanos, forced labor translated into slavery. That is the same deity that my mother and my grandmother, every time that my brother and I were sick, or my brother and I had to take a test or an exam. I mean, you know, I mean, they were always praying to this same deity for us. So when I read that in the Scourge of Hyacinth, A, a Scourge of Hyacinth is actually the name of the novel that Wallace Oyinka wrote for BBC Radio. And then what I did is that I took the A away, and then the title of the opera is the Scourge of Hyacinth. So when I read that, I said, oh my God, I have to write this opera. It was so an incredible impact for me to read that this mother was praying to this very same deity for the salvation of her son, and that my grandmother and my mother, since I was a child, were praying to the same deity. So I found a connection immediately. And I said to Wally, of course, you know, <laughs> you know, and then we worked very hard, and I must say also that Hans Werner Hense, which is the one that believed that I could write an opera, when he told me I wanted to write an opera, I said, I don't like opera. <laughs> you know, I'm not going to write any opera. He said, well, you're going to write an opera. I said, okay, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so that's how the thing started. Oh, I never knew and that. The first um, director was Mark Lemos in uh, Munich. Uh, Munchen. And then the biggest production was with Robert Wilson in Geneva with yeah. Orchestra of the Swiss Romand. I conducted all of the performances. That's where my chops as an opera conductor really polished. The time is ripe for it to be done in the United States because even here, the kinds of things that we see happen in the world, it could happen here too. And I think this opera is a very instructive, very kind of a warning to where a society can go if we're not careful about protecting our democracy, our freedom. I don't know. I have no idea. But I think that sometimes when I read history and I equate that to our times, everything is a repetition. Yes. We're repeating and repeating and repeating even slavery it might be in, in different forms. There is actually a slavery in forms of women being treated as slaves or children being treated as slaves. It's power and the power of mind power over people. 
I sometimes even think about when I go to the Rome and I go to the Colosseum, I get these images in my mind about the lions eating people and some people applauding. And they Instead would today as well, yeah. With masses of people just go like a herd behind ideas, thinking that an idea is going to actually get them to the paradise that they think without the effort of really working hard every day and, and preparing oneself in order to understand others and treating each other kindly. And to be you a see. new person every day. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> and to end this on a more positive note, everything does repeat itself. I am so happy that we repeated having another conversation and we had a very different conversation that was also filled with so many thoughts that hopefully will resonate with a lot of people and inspire people. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Me. I just want to make sure that you know how much I admire you. I love you. You're a colleague that have been there for me and for many of us doing real work in order to give us voice through your mediums and the music box is not only thinking about the exercise of actually giving us a space, but uh, actually with the respect that we treat us and how you communicate with us and how we exchange ideas and, and put things to work. I mean, that is something that I just want you to know. I'm very grateful and I love our friendship and yes. collegiality. Yes. I do too. Thank you. Yeah. Before we conclude this episode of Sound Lives with Tanya Leon, let's listen to one more bit of her music. This is A La Par for piano and percussion performed by pianist Virginia Perry Lamb and percussionist Chris Lamb from that same CRI CD, which is now available from New World Records. New Music Box is brought to you by New Music USA the resource for adventurous creators and listeners in the U.S. and beyond. This program is funded in part by the National Endowment for the Arts, the New York State Council on the Arts, the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, and listeners like you. If you enjoyed today's episode, visit newmusicusa.org to explore more stories and voices from our new music community.